Hello and welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. An Oklahoma rancher and farmer, Les Feldick has been teaching homestyle Bible classes for 20 years in Iowa, Oklahoma, and Texas. Les Feldick's unique style of Bible teaching has made the books of the Bible come to life. When Les is teaching, it's so interesting that people say time just seems to fly by. And now, here is Les Feldick. Okay, once again, we'll be turning right back to Romans chapter 6. I hope you don't get tired of hearing that. But uh, as I said several programs ago, you know, there is so much repetition from the Apostle's pen here in the early part of Romans that it's for a purpose. Repetition is always for a purpose, and that is to drive these things home. And, uh, you know, that's just one of the, the facts of teaching. You don't just tell people something once. It, it's that over and over and over again that finally begins to make sense of these things. Well, anyway, our television audience, we want to know again. We're so glad that you take us into your home from week to week, and we just always want you to know how much we appreciate your letters, your words of encouragement, your phone calls, and uh, many of you who are getting the tapes and the books and how you're enjoying them. And so again, we just like to always remind our listening audience, because every week we've got new listeners, that all the past programs going all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, and believe it or not now, we are just about ready to start our sixth year. This doesn't seem possible. Uh, we've been on the air five years, at least here in Oklahoma. But uh, they're all available, and you call us on the 800 number or write to us, and we'll get the information out to you. Uh, I was reminded at break time when I gave credit to Larry and his wife, Poole, Larry Poole and uh, Lorna, for transcribing all of this into the printed page, and Margaret and Harold that do all of our book work. It's strictly on a voluntary basis. They don't get a dime for it. And uh, they said, I should be sure and tell you that I don't either. Uh, so far, at least, we've never taken a dime for what we do, except, of course, as our classes will take us a love offering once in a while. No, don't ever accuse them of not being benevolent. But for the most part, we take nothing out of the ministry. We're not on a salary or, or anything like that. But uh, I sometimes lay awake at night. If this cattle market doesn't improve, I may have to. But uh, so far, at least in five years, we've never taken a dime. Everything just stays right in the ministry, and hopefully we'll be branching out to more stations. Okay, now let's get down to the subject at hand, and that's Romans chapter 6, and this whole idea of overcoming the old sin nature, old Adam, and to enter into this new life, which of course is what Christianity is all about. It's not a religion. It is not just something that we work for. It is something that is all accomplished by the grace of God and by His power and that alone. All right, now then in our last program, we talked almost the whole 30 minutes on verse 6. But now let's just review it and come into verse 7. Knowing this, that our old man, the old nature, old Adam, is crucified. He had to be put to death. Now maybe I should stop and qualify. You remember when Adam and Eve were in the garden? And God had made only one stipulation. He only gave them one little responsibility. And what was it? They were not to eat of that one tree, but God said, the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt what? Surely die. Now I call that the very first fundamental law in Scripture. And then it's repeated. Ezekiel, I think it is, it says, the soul that sinneth shall surely die. And then Paul comes in that classic third chapter of Romans, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so God has mandated that as soon as Adam sinned, and as soon as every son of Adam has sinned, what has to be the result? Death. See? And there's no getting around it. The soul that sinneth has to die. It's a command of God. It's the first law. But God gave mankind what we call a loophole. 
Yes, we have to die, but we do not have to die in ourselves. We can take Christ's death as our substitution. And so this is the whole concept now then of the plan of salvation is that, yes, we have to die because we're sinners, but on the other hand, if we'll just simply believe the gospel, then Christ's death takes our place. That's what we call substitutionary death of Christ. He took my place, he took yours, all right? So that's why Paul has to teach that the old Adam has to be crucified, he has to be put to death because he's a sinner. Now then, let's read on. Verse 7, he that is dead is freed from old Adam. Now, one of them has passed away, but years back I used to have two judges in my classes. And whenever we come to something like this, then naturally it always helped to get the feedback from somebody who has first-hand knowledge on these things. And when we come to this idea that old Adam had to die in order to be broken from any relationship in the future, then I would use the analogy, especially with one of these judges in the class, I'd say, well now look, you've got somebody up for murder, and you've gone all the way through the trial process, and it's evident he was guilty. You can almost bet that the jury is going to vote to put him to death. But what if about a week before it's all over, the guy dies? He has a heart attack. He's dead. Then what? Well, you all know how those judges answered. The trial's over. It's all done. You don't try a dead man. Even though he was guilty as could be, there's nothing you can do once he dies that breaks it. Well, now, it's the same way with regard to old Adam. The only way we can separate ourselves from that old Adamic nature is to put Adam to death. And the moment he dies, he loses that control over us. Got the picture? And this is exactly what verse 7 is saying. For he that is dead, he's been crucified, remember, is now freed from old Adam. And until Adam is put to death, he reigns as a king, remember. Don't lose these things as we move on ahead. Now verse 8. So Paul is, is building all of this for our own information to increase our faith of where we are as believers. So now if we be dead with Christ. You see that? In other words, if we have identified with that death, that's where we died. And that all comes by faith, see, when we believe the gospel. So if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. So it isn't a matter of being put to death and then it's over. But old Adam is put to death and life really begins, see. That's when it really begins, when we enter in to this new relationship with God as part and parcel of our everyday existence and experience. All right, now let's move on to verse 9. We're going to make a little headway here anyway. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Now this is another concept that we have to get locked into our thinking. Christ did not have to die over and over and over again. Turn back with me to the book of Hebrews. Because there's one word in the book of Hebrews that I want people to never forget. And it's the word O-N-C-E. Once. Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. All with me? Hebrews chapter 7, and drop down to verse 27. Where Paul, and I'm sure Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, Paul has been referring back to the Aaronic priesthood in Israel. And then he comes down to verse 27, speaking of those priests who needeth not daily, as those priests, to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins, that is, referring now to Christ, compared to the Jewish high priests, 
who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did, what's the next word? Once. See that? For this he did once when he offered up himself. All right, just turn the page, if you will, over to chapter 9, beginning of verse 11. But Christ being come, a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, of this creation. In other words, speaking of the one in heaven. Now verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in how many times? Once. He entered in once into the holy place. And by that one-time entrance, presenting his own blood, what happened? He obtained eternal redemption for us. That settled it. That finished it. I don't know how many remember, but several programs back, I think I made the statement that it is so sad as you and I as believers, I, I trust you feel as I do, as we move through the active world around us. We see these multitudes of people in all of their, in all of their fast lane living, in their hustle and their bustle of life, and they think, no further than this life. They never think of eternity. They never think in terms of God and His Word. And they never come to realize that everything has already been done on their behalf, if they would just believe it. Now, if they had to all of a sudden just do this and do that, and if they would have to quit doing that and quit going there, yeah, then I could feel for them, because that wouldn't be easy. But that's not what they have to do. All they have to do is believe the gospel, and God will take care of all of those so-called hard decisions. But, oh, they're so unconcerned. Well, I said in the last program I was going to show you a verse that, that just opened it up to me here a few weeks ago. We'll look at that next, if I don't forget it. But here now in verse 12, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now skip over in that same chapter to verse 26. Well, let's start at verse 25 to pick up the flow. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others, that is, the animals. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, what's the next word? Once, see? But now, once in the end of the world, or the end of the age, he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. See that? All right, is that the last one? No, I've got one more. In chapter 10, in Hebrews chapter 10, Verse 10, by the which will we are sanctified or set apart through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not talking about the church, which is his body, but his physical body of flesh. Through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, never to have to be done again. And every priest, going back again to Judaism, and every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins, but this man, the Christ. This man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Verse 13, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them who are sanctified. How long? Forever. Forever. Not until we goof it, not until we drop the ball, 
but forever. All right, now I told you if I didn't forget, I was going to take you back and show you the dilemma that the world is in and that we're up against as we commiserate with them. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I had to think for a minute again. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. In my land, if this doesn't say it all, I don't know what does. And so I think God isn't willing that we get frustrated or get discouraged or give up. And I guess I'm as tempted as anyone at times. But let's just realize what we're up against as we think of the unsaved world, unconcerned, living their life only for today and maybe tomorrow with no thought for eternity. Here's their problem. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Now again, I was thinking the other day, I, I used this verse in one of my classes during the week. Maybe the, the world out there doesn't understand what the Scripture means when it says they're lost. I'm afraid too many do not. But see, the Lord Himself many times used earthly analogies, and one He would use so many times was the sheep. Now we know that a sheep would not last 48 hours out in a wilderness without the protection of the shepherd. <coughs> because they have no means of self-defense, they have no smarts of how to defend themselves, they're dumb, they're lost the minute you turn them loose. And again, as I was thinking about it, I, I just pictured a, a sheep out in the, the middle of the Sahara Desert. How long would that critter last? Well, maybe hours. Maybe there aren't as many wild animals out there as there would be in some other locale, but whatever. <clears throat> When you find a sheep out in that kind of a circumstance where death lurks at any moment, <clears throat> he has no talent whatsoever to take care of itself, to feed itself, or to defend itself. What is he? Well, it's lost. It's helpless. It's lost. Well, that's exactly what the Scripture is talking about. This is mankind without salvation. <clears throat> they are lost. They are without any direction in life. They have no anchor. They have no real solid principles. The old Adamic nature is ruling and reigning like a king, but they're lost. All right, now that's exactly what the word means as it's used here in verse 3. Our gospel is hid to them that are lost. They have no idea that they're lost. Neither does a sheep until it's too late, and then he can't do anything about it. All right, now then verse 4. Here is the crucial dilemma. In whom the God of this world... Now, you remember what Ephesians 2 said in our last program? That they are steeped in deadness and the works of the flesh. Same thing here in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them who, what? Believe not. That's why they can't believe the Word, is because Satan has them so totally blinded. Now, you want to remember, you don't have to be in total darkness to be blinded. As you get older, as I'm realizing, night driving isn't as simple as it used to be because lights blind me more than they used to. So what can blind you? A bright light. A bright light can just totally blind you. And that's what happens to a lot of the people of this world who are lost. The things of this world are so bright and they're so glimmering and they're so attractive, but what's it doing to them? It's blinding them. All right, read on. So the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them who believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, or of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. It's there for them, but they're blinded, and they cannot see it. All right, let's come back to Romans chapter 6.
Verse 9, we just commented on, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him, for in that he died, he died unto sin. In other words, he died to take care of the old Adamic nature of mankind once, once forever. But in that he liveth, he didn't stay in the tomb, he's no longer dead, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Now let's go right down into verse 11. Likewise. Oh, what does that mean? Oh, that puts us right into that same category. Likewise, reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed to the old Adam. Now I'm going to say something that a lot of people aren't going to like, but it's the truth of Scripture. When we became a believer, those of you who are genuinely children of God, you're believers, you, you have accepted the gospel and its power. Do you know that that's when we were really given the free will? See, the lost person out there doesn't have as much freedom as he thinks he does. He's entwined in the spider web of the devil, the flesh, and the world. He's all wrapped up, and only the power of God can break that. But once the power of God breaks that binding force of the lost person, we're set free. And this is what Paul expounds on, the freedom of the believer. Now, if we're going to have true freedom, what's that going to do to the exercise of our will? Hey, that leaves it with us. Now, like I say, a lot of people don't like this. But now look at this, this word here in verse 11. Likewise, what's the next word? Reckon. What does that mean? Hey, come to a mental conclusion. You have this freedom now. It isn't something that's commanded or demanded or has already been done, but now it's left with our free will that we're going to have to come to some place of decision even as a believer. Are we going to live spirit-filled lives or are we going to live carnal lives, fleshly lives? Yes, it's possible for a Christian to make that kind of a choice. The admonition, of course, is to be led of the Spirit, to live profitable lives, bring honor and glory to the God of glory by keeping old Adam in subjection. But you have that free will. God has not taken that away from the believer. All right, so reckon you yourselves to be dead indeed unto the old Adam, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. In other words, you've believed and you understand all that the gospel has done for you. Now look at the next verse. Let not. Now again, back up. What does that word L-E-T imply? Choice. See? It's not something that's forced on you. But you are now left as a believer with this choice of letting not old Adam continue to reign in your mortal body. Now, of course, this is the dilemma with a lot of unhappy believers. They're miserable. Why? Because old Adam is still controlling them. And they're the ones left with the choice. He doesn't have to. And see, the implication from Scripture is choose to be a spirit-filled believer and not a fleshly-minded believer. Still both believers. All right, read on. So let not old Adam, verse 12, therefore reign, and I'm going to keep putting it in here until it rings like a bell. Don't let him reign like a king in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lusts thereof. Can it happen? Sure it can. Absolutely it can. Now God is not pleased. And of course the first thing I always have to remind people when they say, well then they're no longer saved. I said, oh no, wait a minute. If a true believer is going to fool around in sin, if a true believer is going to bring reproach upon the name of Christ, the first thing God will do is discipline. That's Hebrews, just as plain as day. Whom God loveth, he chasteneth. He doesn't chasten the unbeliever, but he will chasten the believer if he starts dabbling in sin. 
If the chastening doesn't wake him up, if the chastening doesn't bring him to par, then what will the God do? Take him out. We call that the, the uh, sin unto death. And Paul certainly teaches that. And so I think it is, it's rather sobering that we as believers, yes, we've been given that, that freedom. We've been given that free exercise of will as a believer. But we better be aware that if we start being a little obnoxious in our Christian behavior, God's going to spank. And God is the originator of discipline. He knows how. You know, a lot of child psychologists try to tell our young parents how to discipline. You know, you talk to them first, and then you talk a little stronger second, and then you probably discipline by sending them their room, and only when things get real tough do you give them that spanking on their little rear, which is the real discipline. Well, God knows even how to do all that better, and so he will begin with discipline. And if discipline won't do us, he's going to give us a good old whipping. If that doesn't do it, we're out of here. And I've seen it happen. Oh, I've seen it happen. Where a believer just refuses to come back and bring honor to the glory of God, just that quick they're gone. Now, I don't believe they were lost. I believe God took them out for a purpose so that they would no longer bring reproach to his name. And so when I teach these things concerning our free will, that doesn't mean that, like Paul said, I'm falsely accused, that I teach go ahead and sin if you want to because the grace of God is greater. No, no, you're not going to get away with it because God is not going to let his name be dragged through the mud of this world. All right, we got a few seconds left. So, uh, verse 12 again. So let not, don't let old Adam... Therefore, reign like a king in your mortal body. In other words, in our activities of everyday life. That you should obey it, old Adam, in the lusts or the desires thereof or of the flesh. And then in verse 13, and we'll pick this up in our next program. Neither, what's the next word? What kind of a word is that? It's a choice word again, see? It's going to be up to us. Are we going to keep old Adam under subjection? And are we going to let Christ and his spirit reign as a king? Or are we going to give old Adam free reign and let him reign like a king? Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a weekly Bible study. If you would like more information about the Les Feldick Ministries, a Bible study in your area, or about this program, write to Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kinta, Oklahoma, 74552. That's Route 1, Box 760, Kinta, Oklahoma, 74552. Through the Bible with Les Feldick is viewer supported and your gift is appreciated. Thank you and be sure to tune in next time for Through the Bible with Les Feldick.